my friend um, Chris was trying to ask his girlfriend Jessie to marry him. I hope I've got this story right. Uh, Chris and Jessie, they were walking at the foot of a cliff on the beach, and it was beautiful. Uh, the sands were gold, and the sun was bright, the sea was blue. Um, and uh, Chris, he had this amazing ring in his pocket, and he got down on his knee um, to ask Jessie to marry him. Um, it was so romantic. And at that moment, on the cliff high above them, a rabbit decided to launch itself off the cliff. And the rabbit came um, plummeting down and it crashed, splat, at their feet. And um, it's a true story. And uh, uh, Jessie had no idea what Chris was trying to do. She was just totally overcome by this uh, ex-rabbit, which was now pulverized at their feet. It's not funny. Um, I wonder if that's like our initial reaction to this uh, Bible reading. This talk of, um, of wives submitting to husbands, it really jars, doesn't it, in our modern Western culture. Maybe it touches a very raw nerve, a painful nerve, uh, from your experience. Uh, we, we come to this passage because our practice is simply to preach systematically through books of the Bible. Um, and that's a great thing, because it means that God sets the agenda, we don't. We preach the passages, we might not necessarily uh, pick and choose otherwise. And it means that I don't have to pretend to have any kind of um, authority to moralize on any particular thing. I'm all too aware of my own failings as a husband. Um, how could I possibly preach on marriage, let alone on um, uh, on how women are meant to be wives. I can't in and of myself, but God can. And so I'm not going to be giving you my hot tips, uh, but simply explaining what God says here. Uh, God made us, God made marriage, so God alone has the right to tell us how to live. And his instructions for marriage are going to be the best. So this is going to be good. After the incident with the rabbit... Chris tried again, and this time, no rabbit. Jesse understood what he was doing, and it was wonderful. And uh, we're thankful for that. And when we understand this Bible reading in its wider context, uh, we will discover that God designed for marriage, properly understood, is a beautiful and joyful and liberating thing. I realize that some, perhaps in the room or perhaps watching online, might wonder, how is this relevant for me? Maybe if you're not married, um, you might think, what has it got to do with me if it's for husbands and wives? Uh, well, this really is relevant for you because this is how you can pray for and encourage those who are married. We need you to encourage and help us. And um, if you hope to be married one day, this will help you to get ready and it will help you to choose uh, somebody. And whoever we are, uh, beyond the love of uh, of, of the human marriage, we will see here the love of Jesus. Jesus, the ultimate husband who laid down his life for us. Uh, we'll see two points, uh, one for wives, one for husbands. And although the most of this text is uh, for wives, actually um, we'll spend half the time on each and the, the impact for men will be just as challenging, I think, when we come to it. So hold on tight. Um, worth just saying, for youngsters, there is a worksheet in the reception. If you need that, uh, you're very welcome to pop out and get that. So first, ladies, and it says, wives, submit like Jesus. Wives, submit like Jesus. Look down, would you please? This is not my word. See what God says here. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. Wives submit like Jesus. Now, what does that mean? It means that God's design for marriage is that husbands should give a loving lead and that wives are to joyfully follow. But why does it say in the same way? Why does it say wives in the same way submit yourselves? 
Well, look up what's, what's Peter just been writing about. It's not rocket science. Just before, uh, yes, he's been writing about submission in other contexts, and thank you, Pete, for explaining that so well last week. But especially he's been talking about the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus who suffered in our place. So glance back, if you have a Bible, to chapter 2 and verse 21, where it says this. Chapter 2, verse 21, he, sorry, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And then he says, in the same way, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. So your model is none other than the glorious Lord Jesus. And what you're doing is showing the world something of him. When Jesus came to earth and died in our place on the cross, he submitted to someone else's will. He submitted to the will of God the Father. Jesus chose to, chose to submit, not under compulsion, he chose freely and willingly and joyfully. And that means that submission does not have to be a demeaning, enslaving thing. It is noble and glorious and divine. One reason I think why we struggle uh, with this instruction is because we've bought the lie. We've bought the lie that you are not truly equal unless you have equal roles. Surely, though, God the Son is equal in value with God the Father. They have different roles. But no one would say that God the Son is not equal in value to God the Father. And yet one loving leads, lovingly leads and the other joyfully submits. In the same way, husbands and wives are absolutely equal in value. And yet it says wives submit like Jesus. Now what doesn't this mean? It might help us, help us to think, what does this not mean? It does not mean that women should submit to men in general. Uh, can women be leaders in business and politics, etc., etc.? Absolutely yes. We're thankful for the progress that's been made towards equality in those areas. But this is talking very specifically about submission within individual marriages. Help. Does it mean that a wife can't um, discuss, advise, if necessary, argue with her husband. No, on the contrary. I need Hannah to tell me honestly when I'm getting things wrong. She is my best advisor. I want her to do that. But it does mean that when all is said and done, a Christian wife is to joyfully submit like Jesus. Now, if we think this is enslaving, may I say we've, understood, we've misunderstood it. The women who read this in Peter's day would have found this incredibly liberating and empowering. See, he's putting the ball in their court. He says here, can you see carefully? Oh, he doesn't say, he doesn't say, husbands, make your wives submit. The Bible never says that. He says, wives, submit yourselves. That was very liberating, because in that culture, women were not free to make their own choices. Uh, they were not free to have their own independent friends. They were not free to have their own religion. In their religion, teaching would have been directed to the men, and from then to the women, indirectly. But God gives wives here the dignity and honor of choosing for themselves, freely and willingly, to submit. Not because they're forced to but because they want to copy the Lord Jesus. For some of these wives, there is a very special goal. Look again at verse 1 with you. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. Some of these women got married before they became Christians. And then they became Christians, but their husbands did not. And that can be very painful. That's why the Bible says very clearly elsewhere that Christians should only marry Christians. 
And yet, once someone is in that situation, they have a chance to win their spouse's heart for the Lord Jesus. To win them, Peter says, without words. Now, it doesn't say without the words. Not without the message of Jesus. If anyone is to come to know the Lord Jesus, they need to hear the message of the good news about Jesus. But once they've heard the message, it may be the godly life of their spouse, which wins them without words. Wives, submit like Jesus. Now, what does that actually look like? You know, Peter doesn't tell us what it actually looks like. He doesn't give us details. Uh, he doesn't say that we have to stick to traditional stereotypes. Now, maybe don't be too quick to throw out all the traditional stereotypes. And yet he gives freedom for husbands and wives to work out the details in their own marriages. To work it out for themselves. Freedom for the wife to have a job or not. Freedom for her to earn more than her husband or not. Freedom for him to do the cooking uh, or, or not, Nick. <laughs> uh, in our own home, um, Hannah looks after the finances. Uh, she's just better at that. Uh, and that's great. And yet the principle of submission stands. And that can be, feel hard, I think, in a culture uh, where we're brought up to be independent. And it can be hard, in a, it, it can be hard when often, actually, the wife is right and the husband is wrong. Often that's the case. And this can be hard. I might say uh, that a Christian marriage is beautiful when both sides play their part. And it is. When the husband gives a loving lead, not putting himself first, but putting his wife first in every occasion. And when she, um, uh, when she follows as his wisest counsellor, how beautiful that is compared with, with a jostling, selfish um, power battle uh, within a marriage. And yet, it can be even more beautiful when someone honours their spouse even though their, their spouse it, uh, fails. But they do it for the Lord's sake. They do it for the Lord's sake. That's what chapter 2 verse 13 said. Again, if you have your Bible, glance back at chapter 2 verse 13 where it says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, uh, whether to da-da-da-da-da. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. So even when our spouse fails and is not worthy, um, Jesus is always worthy. So let's do it for him. I realise I'm preaching to the converted here. I want to commend... Uh, you ladies, because I see that you are godly uh, ladies. Um, I don't know everything that happens in your homes, but it seems to me that you are humbly supporting your husbands. I guess, to be, uh, to be fair, many of you ladies actually set us blokes an example with your, your daily Bible reading and your prayer. And uh, that is humbling to me. And we thank God for you. Please keep going. And more. And yet maybe even if, even though you are doing that, you are submitting, and yet maybe you find it a bitter pill sometimes. Um, and maybe you, you struggle with it, and uh, it feels tough, and you're tempted to resist it. And yet, can we see, God says here, this submissive spirit is incredibly precious and beautiful. Look at verse 3, would you please? 1 Peter 3, verse 3. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles or the wearing of gold jewellery or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which, which is of great worth in God's sight. Now, does that mean that you can't uh, wear a little jewellery and a pretty dress? Uh, no, it doesn't say that. It does say, uh, don't find your beauty in those things. Um, don't, uh, it says, prioritize beauty in the heart and identify your beauty there. Maybe that challenges how we compliment one another or even how we, how we praise little children, perhaps. 
uh, it's nice, isn't it, to say, um, oh, well done, you're, um, uh, you've been losing weight, or you're looking pretty, you're keeping fit. Nice to compliment each other. And yet, let's, most of all, praise beauty on the inside. I prioritize compliments there. So we could say, look, I thank God for that kind thing that you did, or that wise thing that you said that was beautiful. I thank God for that. This week I asked a couple of you ladies how you responded to these verses. I wondered if you'd find them difficult. And yet actually you said they're very liberating. You said if you depended always on your outward appearance for your identity, then every, every morning you see another wrinkle or every year you pass would be a disaster. And yet if we find our, our beauty in the heart, then there is hope to grow in beauty as we follow the Lord Jesus more closely. Uh, why does verse 4 say, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit? Does it mean that you have to be literal, literally quiet and mousy and shy and seen and not heard? Does it mean you, you can't disagree with your husband? And no, it doesn't. The Bible uses those same words to describe Jesus himself. It says, you remember, that he, Jesus rode into Jerusalem, gentle and riding on a donkey. But what was the very next thing he did? He rolled up his sleeves, went into the temple, and drove out, physically drove out the traders there. So the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit is not being a shrinking violet. But it is this. It is to have enough strength, and courage to submit like Jesus, and end of verse 6, not to give way to fear. That is of enormous worth in God's sight, he says. Well, first wife, submit like Jesus. And you've been very patient, but here is our second and final point. Secondly, husbands, be considerate like Jesus. This is verse 7. Be considerate like Jesus, husbands. Look at verse 7, please. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. You might wonder, why do the wives get six verses of instructions and the husband gets only one? I can only think it's because um, women are much better at holding lots of things in their heads than us men are. And we need things simple. I, I can't keep three things in my head. Uh, I need just one thing to go away with. Husbands, be considerate like Jesus. Why does it say like Jesus? Why do I say like Jesus? Sorry. Why do I say like Jesus? Well, where, where in verse 7 does it say that? Well, in verse 7 it says in the same way. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate. Now, what does it mean? Verse 1, remember, wives in the same way. Now, verse 7, husbands in the same way. In the same way as Jesus. Remember chapter 2, verse 21, and again, just before this. To this you are called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example. In the same way, husbands, be considerate. Um, again, maybe we struggle with this because Peter calls women uh, the weaker partner. Again, in our culture, that, that clashes and jars. What did he mean? Uh, or, well, I guess at, at one level, simply physically weaker. Uh, that's obviously true, I suppose, in, in many cases. But actually, in that pagan culture, socially weaker too, as we've seen. A woman could not have her own life in that pagan culture. Um, she couldn't have her, her own friends. Um, in that way, she was socially the weaker partner as well. And yet, what Peter says here is really radical at that time. It's really liberating. Because, he says, before God, your wives are absolutely your equal. He says they are heirs with you of God's grace. Free to follow Jesus and to join the local church family. So husbands, husbands be considerate. Now, in the light of the hashtag MeToo movement, we must be really clear, there is absolutely no place for abuse. That's taken as read. 
But perhaps the more subtle danger for um, us Christian blokes um, is the danger, uh, not so much of physical abuse, but uh, of taking our wives' compliance for granted. Perhaps the danger of demanding submission, when the Bible never gives us the right to demand it. Uh, The danger of being overbearing, of being controlling. Uh, And I used to be better at this. When Hannah and I were first married, once a week, I think, it'd start with at least once a month, we'd sit down and have a, we call it a marriage chat. And I'd say to Hannah, how how am I getting on? How how, how am I doing as a husband? And uh, we need to get that going again, I think. That's good. Um, To say to her, look, uh, how, how am I doing at the whole leadership thing? I have a chance for her to say to me, look, Ruben, you're being a bit controlling at the moment. Uh, or whatever it is. Husbands, let's be considerate to our wives. I need to draw Hannah in to make decisions together. And yet even if we don't agree, and even if I have to make a decision for us both, that decision must never be what's best for me, but always what's best for her. Always putting her needs first. And if ever I do become overbearing or controlling, um, Hannah knows that I want her to be able to come to you, the church family, and to ask for help. Husbands, be considerate like Jesus. Uh, Maybe we think uh, considerate sounds a bit weak, a little bit easy, compared to what the wives have to do. And yet again, the model here is Jesus. And think what a considerate husband Jesus is. The Bible is God's love story. And the climax of God's love story is that Jesus uh, willingly came to earth and died on the cross for us. That he sacrificed himself to pay the price, uh, not for those who'd done good, but for those, for us, who had committed spiritual adultery against him. We are the brides. We had been unfaithful again and again to him, and yet he came and lived and died in love, laid down his life to pay the price to buy us back. Rising again to gather us, the bride, for that ultimate wedding day. That's the story of the Bible. Not only did Jesus put his bride first, he crucified his rights for her. So husbands, let's be considerate like that. Uh, Let's have some examples. Uh, Here's a trivial one. Uh, If we can't agree what film to watch on a Friday night, she wants to watch a rom-com. I want to watch an action thriller. Well, I need to say, well, look, let's, let's watch the rom-com. Lay down my life for her. That's trivial, isn't it? More seriously, husbands, let, let's be considerate in how we use our time, how we use our money. Let's not behave as if we were bachelors or invest too much in our hobby. We've chosen to be married and we've chosen to have children. Well, let's cheerfully spend our time serving our family. Now, this, this doesn't mean, say, I should be a doormat. If after a, a lot of patient discussion, I might need sometimes to make a decision that my wife would not have made. And yet, um, and perhaps, perhaps spend some time serving the Lord in some way, rather than simply socialising. But let's be considerate in how we talk to our wives. I guess this works both ways. Let's not undermine their parenting in the way that we talk in front of our children. Uh, Let's not publicly criticise our spouses or mock them. Above all, let's be faithful to them. Husbands, let's not uh, humiliate our wives by giving in to secret porn or whatever it is. Well, just a few examples. Let's be considerate. I know that I've often failed as a spouse. Maybe you have too. But in Jesus, wonderfully, we find full and free forgiveness. Please, tonight, let's commit our failures and our our futures to the Lord Jesus. Before we close, uh, again, maybe you're you're not married and you wonder, really, what what has this got to do with me? Well, on, on the one hand, Again, we need your prayers, those of us who are married. We need your advice and your encouragement. Um, And yet more than that, beyond the application to human marriage, we see here 
the love of God, and of the Lord Jesus, the greatest husband. Our friend uh, Rebecca Beale writes about um, her own splattered rabbit experience. When she first came across the Bible's teaching on this, and she first thought it was awful, but then she discovered the sacrifice that God calls husbands to make, to lay down their life for their wives, and then she discovered the love of God and Jesus as the ultimate husband. And she saw beyond the human story the splattered blood of the Lord Jesus kneeling in the sand on her feet. And she wrote this, Ultimately, my marriage is not about me and my husband any more than Romeo and Juliet is about the actors playing the title roles. She said, We live in a world where sexual and romantic fulfillment are paraded as ultimate goods. But missing marriage and gaining Christ is like missing out on playing with dolls as a child, but growing up to have a real baby. She writes, so we need not worry about whether we married the right person, or why our marriages are not flinging us to a constant state of nirvana. Human marriage calls me toward Jesus, the one man who truly deserves my submission. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we are sorry for our failures. And we thank you for your forgiveness through the Lord Jesus. Thank you that he is the the greatest husband. And the greatest model to both husbands and wives. Help us to look to him. In Jesus' name. Amen.